All right, good morning, church. Hope you've had a good weekend, homecoming weekend. Um, how many of you tech fans were nervous last night? Anybody watch that game? I didn't know. I was getting nervous for you watching it. Um, I'm glad that college football is back in some some way at least, and so that's uh, that's good. And slowly getting things back to normal. We had Bible classes this morning for the first time in almost six months. So hopefully you were able to attend Bible class this morning. If not, we will start back on that. We have that as part of a regular schedule now. So if you missed this morning, uh, please come back next Sunday, 9 a.m. And then our normal work at 10. Obviously, we're back in this building. That's good news too. So glad you're here this morning. I want to start off with a, a little, I guess, game. You've probably heard this game before. Ever played that game, Would You Rather? Anybody heard of that? Okay. So we've got two different choices. Some of them, as you go through the game, they're really simple. Uh, you know, would you rather have a, a cheeseburger or a steak? Right? Maybe that's an easy answer for you. Maybe it isn't. And as you go through the game, the, the questions and the answers get progressively harder. And so I'll just kind of give you some examples from, from this game. So, first one. Would you rather eat every meal standing up or get in your car through the passenger side every time? Okay? For the rest of your life, would you rather, every, even when you're in a hurry and when you're late for work, you still have to get into the passenger door? Or would you rather eat every single meal that you have, even at restaurants, standing up? Okay? So that's a silly part of the game, one of the questions that comes up. How about this one? Would you rather lose all your money and valuables or lose every picture you have ever taken? A little bit tougher. Have you? Would you rather have the size, a head the size of a watermelon, or a head the size of a lemon? Hmm. Okay, something to, something to ponder. Here's this last one. Would you rather be able to take a shower every single day, but it has to be a cold shower, or you're able to take one shower a week? It's hot. Which one would you rather choose? We're going to look at this text in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you want to turn over there, we're looking at these choices that God is giving Israel. He says, if you do this, here's what's going to happen. And if you do this, here's what's going to happen this way. And he's going to present this to them in the form of blessings and curses. And this is a very long chapter. We're not going to look at the whole chapter. 68 verses in total. Uh, but we're going to look at the different parts of this as far as the blessings and the curses. So if you want to follow along in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we'll start there in verse 1. It says, Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And this is where He comes in with the blessing. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offspring of your beast, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way, and they'll flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns, and all that you put your hand to do, and He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to Himself, as He swore to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways. And He'll go on in the next few, four or five verses, Continuing this idea, if you do this, everything, basically everything you touch, I'm going to bless you. And so when you go through Deuteronomy 28, that first part of it, uh, he is going to, to say, here's all the blessings. If you will follow me, you'll be blessed. And he only does that for the first 14 verses. The whole rest of the chapter, which is a big chunk, from verses 15 through 68, he gets really descriptive of what these curses are going to be if you don't follow them. And so we'll just look at the first few verses of this section. So they'll start into, on the curses then. And it's the same list as before, but now instead of blessings, it's curses. So in verse 15 he says, It shall come about if you do not 
Obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all His commandments and His statutes with which I charge today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So here he goes with the list. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground. The increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in. And cursed shall you be when you go out. And so he has given this language. And he'll keep going on about this is what's going to happen. If you will follow me, if you obey me, what I'm telling you to do, You'll be blessed. Everything that you do, I'm going to bless it. But, if you don't follow me, here's what's going to happen. Now, I want to present this idea to us. Because what we're really talking about is good times and bad times in our life and how we're going to go through both of those. And we need to be prepared for that. And so I want us to think about this idea that God has not called us to have this easy life. He's called us to be faithful. Sometimes we get the understanding as, as Christians that, well, I'm doing the right thing, so everything should work out. Or I'm living the way that I should, the way that God wants me to do, and so I, I should have everything just magically work out in front of me. Everything's going to be blessed. And I think sometimes we get caught up in this same idea uh, that we see here in Deuteronomy 28. Some people call this idea in Deuteronomy 28 this theology of retribution. What? And so God is saying these things to the Israelites, and sometimes we we get um, we get caught up in reading a text in the Bible and thinking that it has immediate application for us. Deuteronomy 28 is not one of those times. There are things that we read in the Bible that God is addressing to a specific people at a specific time and place in history. He's addressing a specific people in His nation, Israel. And I need us to understand that what is going on in Deuteronomy 28 does not apply to us today. If you get what you deserve, I got bad news. We deserve death because of our sin. In the New Covenant, this idea, this theology of retribution, it does not exist. Romans 3, you're familiar with the verse, in verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he'll say three chapters later, the wages of sin is death. If you want to talk about retribution and carry this idea forward, we're not going to be able to do enough good things to be blessed. We're, we're sinful people. And so you need to understand that when he's saying these blessings and curses, those don't apply to us. We can immediately apply this passage because he's talking to the Israelites. However, having said that, some people take this idea of theology of retribution, you'll hear it in other ways. And it's still prevalent today. One of the things, one of the ways you'll hear this idea, this way of living life presented, is you'll hear it in the word karma. Ever heard of that one? Karma. That what goes around comes around. If I do good, I'm going to have good come back on me. And if I do bad, the bad's going to come back on me. Now, on a very simple level, yes, can you make a choice and it have immediate consequences? Sure. Sure. And some will have more consequences than others. If I steal a candy bar from Alsace, I might get a slap on the wrist. If I commit murder, I'm probably getting 25 to life. Some things, some choices have worse consequences than others, and some of them are more immediate than others. And so, yeah, I can get bad things if I make bad choices, but I shouldn't have this expectancy of if I do good, well, God's going to make everything easy for me. Go through your Bible. It's actually the opposite. God says if you're living a life the way that you're supposed to be, you're actually going to be persecuted for your beliefs. It's going to be the opposite of easy. That you will not be blessed just because you did the right thing. And so when we take this look at karma, how many of you remember this show? I won't judge it if you watch this. All right? How many of you watch this? My name is Earl. You ever seen that? Okay. Uh, this has been on, I guess it's not on TV anymore, maybe syndication, but uh, this, this show has been around for a long time. I can tell you, I've never actually watched a full episode from beginning to end, but I've seen enough of the show, bits and pieces, flipping through the channels, to kind of get the idea of what's going on. And this guy, Earl, he lives with this belief. One of the things the, they use for the show is this idea, is karma is a funny thing. That's one of the taglines for the show. And so it's a pretty prevalent theme in the show, this idea of karma. He, the main character lives with this and tries to impress this upon the other people in the cast. But this is how life works. And 
and if, I, if something bad happens, then it's bad karma, and something good happens, it's good karma. And so it goes throughout the show like this. Now, this is not a new way of thinking, by any means. Uh, if you go back and you look at John's uh, Gospel, you'll see this interaction that Jesus has with uh, this blind man in John chapter 9. And so Jesus says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples ask him this question. They say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? It didn't occur to them that maybe he was just born blind. That it's just part of life. They said, well, something must have happened because this guy is blind and he shouldn't be blind. He shouldn't be born that way. So who messed up? Was it his parents? Was it him? And then Jesus says, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so he uses this opportunity to heal this man, to have this miracle. And the whole chapter, John 9, is about this man's testimony because people just don't believe that he was healed by Jesus. So we have this going on throughout the, the whole chapter. And so we have this idea that, well, something must have happened. He must have done something wrong because this happened to him. We always like cause and effect, sometimes too much. And we think that, well, I, this is going bad for me right now because I must have made a bad choice way back here. So I, wanna, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. I want to show you a verse that a lot of people will go to when they talk about this idea of karma. And if you were just to read it and take it at face value and just read it by itself, you might go, hmm, that kind of sounds like Paul's talking about karma. So the verse is in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Paul says there, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Now if you read that, you go, hmm, I don't know, that kind of sounds like karma. Uh, let me just point out these things to you. These aren't on the, on the screen or anything, but there's a couple of things that are wrong with this idea. I'll, I'll just tell you, you probably know where I'm going with this. Karma is not a biblical concept at all. Karma is from a Hindu and Buddhist background, so that should be enough to tell you that it's coming from a false teaching and a false god. And so that's one of the things that you can understand that karma is not uh, this biblical idea. Uh, the second thing is karma, they believe that you know, you do good, you get good, you do bad, you get bad. But they all believe that it doesn't just happen in this life. They think that if something happened to me bad, maybe I made a bad choice in a past life. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm busy enough, and I haven't had enough trouble with just the one life that I have right now. I don't know if I want to be reincarnated and go through this all over again. But they think, well, I made some choices way back when. Maybe it wasn't in this life, but it was in a past life. And so you can kind of see from the very get-go, it's kind of on shaky foundation, this, this idea, this teaching of karma. But let's look at the verses that surround verse 7 here in Galatians 6. Because he's not talking about karma. In verse 6, right above it, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches them. So he's talking about generosity talking about sharing and giving. And he's actually going to go back to this at the end of this section. And then he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. And here's another difference. He says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. He says, You're going to be either investing, sowing in one of two places, in the flesh or in the Spirit. The flesh is obviously selfish, it's all about me, 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 and the Spirit is others. How can this benefit others? And then he's talking about eternal life. Not, you're going to get paid back for the good or bad that you've done in this life. He's saying in eternal life. And so it's not the same idea. It's not this, I'm going to do good and later on this is going to work out in my favor. He's talking about investing in eternity. And then he'll go back to this idea. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time, and use this word again, we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, based on all this that he said, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. And so you see there's a lot of differences here. Um, it's based on other past lives. It's based on immediacy, that I'm going to get something back it's based on what I can get. It's never about you know, the other person. And then Paul does the exact opposite. 
He says, you are reaping and sowing, not for now, but for later. And you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for others. And so we need to understand that karma is not uh, a biblical concept. And if we were to go even further with this, if you struggle with, well, am I believing along the lines of karma, or am I more in line with what God's Word says? You can ask yourself a couple of questions of, when I do something, what do I expect to happen from this? Do I expect a pat on the back if I do good? Because if so, that's probably karma. You're probably believing along with the lines of karma that you're going to get rewarded for doing something good. If you don't do good to get rewarded and to get a pat on the back, you do good because that's who your God is. And that's how He causes, causes you to live. He wants you to live in the way that His Son lives. So that's why we do good. Not because we expect something. We've already gotten a reward, have we not? When we talk about good and bad times in our life, you and I need to understand, we have already been blessed. Your life from, from today on, you can leave this auditorium this morning and your life could be a train wreck from here until the time you die. And you will still be more blessed than most people in this world because you have forgiveness of sins and you have the hope of heaven. And so you've already been blessed. In a way, you've already gotten part of the reward. The consummation of it is heaven. You've already gotten that reward. Another question you can ask yourself is, what do I deserve? Because when you believe karma, you think, well, I did good, so I should get good back. Or I did bad, so I should get bad back. There's this expectation in what you think you deserve. Again, you and I don't deserve anything. You can take all the good deeds that you could possibly do, and it is still not going to be enough. You can let that person cut in front of you in traffic every single time. You can pay for that lady's groceries in front of you. You can open the door for someone at the restaurant as many times as you want. It's not going to be good enough. And so when you think about karma versus what we see in the Bible, you could say that karma is this idea that you get what you deserve. Well, we don't get what we deserve as Christians because when we look at the Bible and the gospel story, Jesus got what we deserve. You and I can't be good enough to get the gift. It's only through Christ that we have this. Now, I want to jump off this idea of karma and go back to what we're talking about. This idea of just good and bad in life. Sometimes we're going to have good things. Sometimes we're going to have bad things. And not to get confused and to think, well, I'm a Christian, so things should be easy. It's not the case. God's not called us to that. He's called us to be faithful. And so you've probably heard this phrase before, where um, we say bad things happen to good people. Ever heard that? Bad things happen to good people. Is that true? So we could, could we not flip that around and say, well, bad things happen to good people. Do good things sometimes happen to bad people? Right? Those are the people you want to punch in the face, right? <laughs> You're thinking, this guy's getting ahead, this guy's... Everything he touches, he's uber successful. How in the world is all these things working out for this guy? He lives like that. So yeah, good things happen to bad people too. And so if we were to step back and, and make that scope a little bit bigger, we could say the reality is, well, good and bad things happen to good people. And good and bad things, well, they happen to bad people. And we're just kind of all in this together. So, when you go and, and look at some examples of this, we sometimes think, well, if I just do good, maybe things will be easy for me. Or maybe things will work out. God will bless me in some special way. I'll give you a couple examples. Remember Job in his story? Here's a guy who is doing everything by the book. He's doing it the right way. He's got all of these uh, physical blessings. He's got money. He's got livestock. He's got a, a loving family, a wife, and kids. And he is wealthy and prosperous. And so he has all these physical blessings. And then he's blessed spiritually as well because he's, he's doing what God wants him to do. He's a righteous guy. Uh, and, and Satan actually says, you know, hey, let me, let me mess with Job a little bit. And God's, God's actually bragging to Satan about how righteous Job is. Now you think about how good of a person you would have to be for God to brag on you and say, this Job guy, he's righteous. 
And then, so he's doing the right thing. He's living the right way. And then what happens? It just takes a few verses and he loses everything. His kids are killed. And he loses his livestock, his, his house, everything. He gets sores all over his body. His, his wife becomes, you know, this horrible person to live with. And then, to top it off, he has three friends show up. And they basically say, Job, you're, you're in the wrong. And you're, it's because you're sinful and you just need to confess to God and, and this will all work itself out. And so he, they come along to comfort him and it doesn't work out. But we see in his story, you can, he's doing the right thing, is he not? He's living the right way. And yet bad things still happen. Here's the most obvious one. Hopefully you're already thinking about it. What about the life of Jesus? No. Did he not live the right way? Did he not do everything he was supposed to do? Was he not without sin? And yet he is falsely accused. He's beaten. He's put on a cross and nailed to a cross. Yeah, bad things happen to good people sometimes. And so when we look through the Gospels and through the letters, we can see other evidence of this. Of We're just all in this world together. And we don't necessarily get good or bad things in life because of how we were living, but just the fact that we are living at all. That you and I are both going to go through good and bad the rest of our days. That's just a part of our broken, fallen world that we live in. We're going to have good days, we're going to have bad days. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, He, God, causes His Son to rise in the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9, It is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice, and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. And as the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. You're going to have good and bad happen in your life. And we're going to sing a song here in just a few moments, and Joel's going to lead us in this song. And we have that verse that talks about you know, what it's like to hold a newborn baby. And then yet, at the same time, while you're holding that child, knowing this child is going to have uncertainty in life. Because that's the nature of life. Just because that child lives, he's going to go through good and bad. And then the chorus is, well, because we know that God lives. We can get through it. We can get through the good. We can get through the bad. Because He lives. We started off with this silly little game of would you rather. So let me ask you this one. This one's a little bit obvious. A little bit more obvious. Would you rather live through the good and the bad times? Because you're going to have both. Would you rather live through the good and the bad times in life on your own? Or would you rather live through the good and the bad times in your life having a relationship with God. See, that's the difference. One of them offers heaven. One of them offers forgiveness of sin. One of them offers hope. One of them lets you understand that even when you're going through the bad days, it's going to be alright. God has a plan and you're a part of it. And you are blessed beyond measure whether you're going through good or bad. And so we're going to go through good or bad times regardless. I think it would be wise for us to choose the path that includes Jesus in. God has not called us. We've been looking uh, these last four or five weeks in this study in Deuteronomy talking about a faithful life. Uh, in fact, that was the name of the series, Called to Faithfulness. If you think about it, God has not called us to be successful by the world's standards. He's not going to be called us to be happy and content not the aim. He has called us to be faithful. So let us be people this week who live lives of faithfulness to God. Let's pray together. This Father, we are so thankful to have another time such as this to, to get together and to surround this table and be reminded of this great sacrifice that your son went through on our behalf. Father, we know that we deserve death. That despite our best efforts and our best intentions, we can never be good enough to earn our way into heaven. 
And Father, so we, we are so thankful for the grace and the mercy that we receive through Your Son, through His sacrifice on the cross, the hope that we have through His rising from the grave. Father, we can live with hope. And we can live with purpose. And Father, we are thankful that we have uh, this, this hope in our lives, that we have You in our lives. Father, sometimes the world tries to beat us down and we uh, can get discouraged. We can lose heart. Father, help us to be encouraged by the fact that we're not promised an easy life. That we are going to go through good and bad just as much as anybody else. But Father, we have You on our side. And we know the end of the story. Father, help us to be people who live our lives with faithfulness to You, dedication and commitment to You. Father, help us to be good examples to those that we come into contact with this week, that they may see Jesus in the way that we speak and the way that we act. Father, we are so thankful for Your gift of love that it was shown through Jesus. We're thankful for His life and for His sacrifice. We pray all these things through His name this morning. Amen.